Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the editor-in-chief of Talk House Film, and you're listening to the Talk House Film Podcast. Husband and wife filmmaking team Lawrence Michael Levine and Sophia Takal have been contributors at Talk House Film for almost as long as the site has been around. Opening in theatres this week is Wild Canaries, a Brooklyn hipster reimagining of Woody Allen's Manhattan murder mystery written, directed by and starring Levine, and produced by and starring Takal. So we thought we'd honour the event with a podcast. Chatting with Takal and Levine, who goes by Larry, is another Larry, Larry Karashevsky, the screenwriter and producer who, with his creative partner Scott Alexander, has collaborated with such iconic directors as Milos Forman on The People vs. Larry Flint and Man on the Moon, and Tim Burton, for whom the pair wrote both Ed Wood and last year's Big Eyes. Though Karashevsky works exclusively in the studio system, he is known to Kyle and Levine, as well as others in their creative circles such as Joe Swanberg, for some time now, so this was very much a conversation between friends. All right, who should start talking first? Thanks for doing this, Larry. Pre- really appreciate You're it. You're very welcome. Thank you, Larry and, and Sophia. It's an honor to have an esteemed talent such as yourself talking to us. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I saw your movie this week. I really liked it. Did you? Cool. That would be awkward if you didn't. <laughs> well, I just want to come on and say better luck next time. <laughs> <laughs> you you tried. I was trying to get to you, talk to you personally, but the Skype thing came through and... Right. So I just thought I'd tell you on, on the podcast that, um, you know, nice try. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I was trying to... Well, let's just go right into the question. How did, how did, how did the movie come together? What, what made you guys want to make, um, uh, make this film? We had made a couple um, more serious ones, and I had written a more serious one before this script, which Sophia directed recently in October, so... A lot of serious stuff going on, and then I just wanted to do something that was on the goofy side. And uh, we were watching a lot of mysteries and thought they were really funny, sometimes unintentionally, sometimes intentionally. And we thought, okay, let's let's try one like this. Like, what kind of mysteries? What were you watching? Like, what kind of stuff? The Thin Man. The Thin Man. Thin Man's the greatest movie ever. Actually, after The Thin Man's the greater one. I do too. We watched all of the Thin Men. We, wa- we watched all of the Thin Man. The movie was an. You know the later ones. The later ones get a bad rap because they really just become just kind of uh, studio product. But I always get a kick out of seeing Asta and the kids and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I I'm with you. I think almost any Thin Man is is a is a fine way to spend an afternoon. Exactly. Yeah. I grew up in um, uh, outside of Chicago in this town south of Indiana, and there was this. TV station, WGN. Oh, I think it's like a super station. Everyone gets it. But they would on Sunday mornings, I think at 1030 or something like this, have this, like, for some reason, it was like the mystery movie slot. And it would, one week would be a Thin Man, next week would be a Charlie Chan, the next week would be a Sherlock Holmes. And it would just be, they were just grabbing those old um, mystery movies from the, from the, you know, the 30s and 40s. That's so cool. Yeah, and so that's how I saw all. I actually some of those movies I've never revisited, but that's how I watched all those movies originally. And I remember being so entertained, and I remember what, particularly the Thin Man. I always wanted to grow up, and um, I, I kind of did. I kind of married Myrna Loy. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so, will will join me at the bar and order three martinis right off the bat, you know? Yeah, well, she's she's incredible in that series, and I don't know what it is about mysteries, but like there's something just so cozy and comforting about them, especially if they're lighthearted, like. I could we could get into bed and watch four or five episodes of Columbo no problem if we're in the right mood. Something about just something about Well, especially like the older ones cuz they are a lot simpler and it feels you I, I don't know, yeah, like especially like the Thin Man, it just makes me feel like I'm living in a time that I think is so cool that I never got to really live in. Like right. you feel like cuz like cuz of how drunk they are and how much fun they're having while they're making the movie. Yeah. Are you thinking of like com- comparing it to like CSI or something like Compared that? Compared to like, yeah, the weird complicated... There's so much more romance. Yeah, there's more romance. I don't understand those shows. There's, there's, there's very few rape kits in, in, in there. <laughs> exactly. I don't understand why people are into that stuff. I don't, I'm not into it at all. Like, I can't watch an episode. Of, that's like... Uh, Emily and I can't watch that stuff either. We, we just uh, instantly zone out. They seem, they seem so, so mean. Um, you know, I'm not actually talking about any specific show, but anytime I watch any of those kind of detective shows now. But, you know, I mean, the reason I think you can watch, watch them is it's the mystery element. It is simply you're watching, you get, you get hooked. Just because it's simply, 
you know, someone's dead and someone's got to solve the crime. And that's why there is so much television based yeah. on that. I mean, I've never really, uh, I'm doing my first t- TV thing now, but one of the reasons I've never done television before is is that life and death stakes thing for me has always been a very difficult thing to sort of sort of uh, embrace. You know, I'm, I'm not good with, like, clues and... Right. right. It's sort of the writing backwards kind of it all, and that's what that's I think that's what that kind of show needs, um, you know. And um, uh, but that's why that's why there's so much of it because that's why there's so much detective shows and doctor shows mm-hmm. because life hangs in the balance. I was really conscious of trying to. I felt like we made these movies, Green and Gabby on the Roof in July, that we liked, but. You know, audiences were kind of, some people liked it and a lot of people didn't. So, and I realized we didn't really think about our an audience. We thought, let's just see if we can make movies. Let's see if we can make something that we like. Let's make the process fun and interesting. I didn't really think about um, who would be watching it. And with this one, I was like, I, I want to see if I can make a movie that more people will like. And uh, it was really just simple as that. And uh, it's kind of a good feeling after we do screenings of this movie, you know, people like laugh at it in unison and in a, in a theater, it feels really good. So I feel like I was very conscious of using that, that traditional kind of thing. Somebody, somebody, there's a mystery introduced pretty much right away. Right. There's action. There's laughs. You guys have done the whole making movies for your, for yourself and for the whole film festival crowd. And so I, I, you know, I just feel maybe there's a little bit of an itch in you saying like, well, look, can we, can we, can we still do what we do, but maybe you know, reach a reach a bigger audience and and not give up what we do. I mean, here's the thing. I I think it's totally possible because, but um, I think at the, I was at the Memphis Film Festival. I met you guys at the Memphis Film Festival one year, but I came back some other year and they had me give out the screenwriting award. And I watched whatever, you know, you watch those 20 movies that, that come to the film festival things, and you're just watching these things saying, like, wait, I'm supposed to give a screenplay award to some of this stuff? <laughs> it's like, re- did they have a screenplay? You know, I don't, you know, and so you just literally, you're watching, and sometimes it's an interesting film, but you know, there wasn't a, there wasn't a screenplay around. And, and, and sometimes you can admire that. Yeah, I certainly admire the, the, you know, that sort of element of cap- capturing naturalism and trying to escape from the fact that, you know, all these movies have to solve problems and save the cat and all that kind of crap uh, that, you know, this is sort of ruining mainstream cinema, cinema right now. But but I also feel that there's a touch of laziness in that, you know, they, people are so eager to make a movie that they forget to make it about something. And so they, they somehow turn writing, writing a screenplay into an enemy as opposed to a thing that that, that is, uh, you know, it's just like an architect trying to build a house without making plans first, you know. So, you know, who knows, maybe you can build a, some, a structure that can keep the rain out and you can sleep under, but, you know, I wouldn't trust it to last very long. Yeah, I know I know what you mean. I, I mean, I don't have any particular judgment about scripts that don't, I mean, movies that don't use scripts. I think some of them are good as well, but I think it's maybe becoming a little bit of a lost art writing good dialogue, um, writing, you know, writing a great screenplay. I think people are kind of less literate now. They're maybe more used to watching TV and movies and less. I, I don't know. I think that has something to do with it, that people are just not reading as much. So they're not yeah. really understanding how to write as much. I don't know. Does that make I sense? I think writing is just. They use. Go ahead. Oh, no, no, no. I want to hear what you have to say. Well, no. Yeah, it is. It is but once again, I'll go back to laziness in that, in that it becomes it's hard. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was just going to say. It's harder to stare at a blank page and try to figure out what happens than say, "Hey, I got, I have three clever guys and or and a couple of girls. We're gonna we're gonna rent that house over the weekend, and it's gonna be oh, Brenda's breaking up with him, and we're all gonna react and we'll make it up." Right. And if I mean, sometimes that works. I'm not I, once again, I'm not knocking that, that. There's a bit of excitement to some of that, um, um, but uh, you know, I think. And in some of those cases, you don't need to write. You don't need to write a regular screenplay. You don't need to write dialogue, dialogue. You know, you can do that sort of thing that Larry David does on on Curb Your Enthusiasm, which is basically you write you write your your script men, I think is what they call it. And it's it's you know you basically are plotting out what's supposed to happen in every scene, 
uh, or what you want to get to, and then your clever, funny people, you know, are there to sort of, you know, add reality and bring spice to it. I mean, I worked, I made a couple movies with Milos Forman, who, um, uh, you know, is really about trying to capture, uh, all about trying to capture real life on film. And so, you know, we, Scott and I would write a real just, you know, complex scene and, and with all this dialogue that, that's really, really good. And he would, he would film that, but then he would also let the actors loose a bit. And the actors could, you know, so, so it would be our two-page scene on, a, on the page would become, um, you know, a five- or six-minute scene when they shot it. Mm-hmm. Now, Milo should go back to the editing room and uh, with, the, with the security of knowing that, oh, the, the two pages that Scott and I gave him were what the scene was about. He could he can connect that scene from the from the scene that came before it and the scene that comes after it and the plot would continue and everything like this. But if Courtney or Woody or Ed or whatever did something, um, you know, threw out some wild line that 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 just all of a sudden had that uh, I think Neil should call him unrepeatable moments. He was looking for unrepeatable moments. Um, you know, if they if they had accomplished something like that in the middle of the scene, he could go for that with the security of knowing he could get back he could get back to the roadmap and, and that and that and so that that to me is 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 the, the way to use improvisation in a, in a, in a, in a movie and that in that you know you you know where the movie's going um uh but you it's not so it's not this total carefree and uh you know which i think what you did a bit in this movie where it's like you know uh, it's you uh you know what that's what the murder mystery gives you in this film yeah i i actually Um, Foreman was a really big influence on me. It was people like Foreman and Robert Altman and John Cassavetes who really influenced me stylistically. I just like that natural feel, but really tied to a a story. Like if you look at something like Fireman's Ball, like that movie just seems so, it's so funny and entertaining. And it's also seems like total real life, but it's very, very structured. So, you know, that was the, that's the kind of film that I really, really wanted to make or want to make. So I do that. Yeah, I write a script, but I let the actors, you know, we do, I shoot it until I feel like we have that, maybe four takes or something like that. And then we just start to go off of it. And I think it creates a uh, live, you, you get the most, best, best of both worlds that way. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. I think that would throw out to you guys too. Is what I want to know is 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 you guys consider yourself actors or actors first and then filmmakers second, or was this when you guys decided to make? Because you guys are in all your films. Did you guys make movies because you wanted to be in movies, or did you make movies because you you know where 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 does it come? Would you guys ever make a movie that you're not in? I would definitely make a movie I was not in. Yeah, sure. Um, but that doesn't mean I don't consider myself an actor, you know? Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess if I had to choose, if someone had a gun to my head, I would We talk about this all the time. Isn't that funny? What? I feel like we talk, we want, we talk about this all the time. My perception is that Larry is more of a writer director first and that I'm more of an actor before I'm a writer Mm -hmm. director. But then you're always like, no, but I'm an actor. You show up. You show up in a lot of movies that you're not the you're not the creative force behind. Yeah, but I just directed a movie that I'm not in, which Larry d- hasn't done. Wow, that that sounds good. Good. I mean, I like you both as performers, but I would love to see, um, uh, you know, you guys in in do direct a movie that where you're not in. My problem when I see a director in a movie, particularly a movie like this, I feel I, I'm watching them direct the scene a little bit. As as the as the movie goes on, you said that about Gabby on the roof in July too. I thought that was funny. Can you describe that in greater detail? I wonder what you mean because I certainly don't feel like I'm directing the scenes from within. I mean, I mean, it isn't one of those things that's incredibly obvious, but I feel like you know you're you're sometimes not even you. And the the, the, the when I see this, I, the person who is sort of you're throwing out lines that are propelling plot, or you're throwing out lines to provoke something. And it's a little it's a little different than the regular the other performers in 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 in, in the movie. And once again, I'm, I can't even think of specific scenes I'm talking about in Wild Canaries. I would I would you know just say that sometimes when I see a, a director in a scene, I'm I'm it maybe because my I'm bringing something to the table. I'm watching. I know that that guy is thinking of making their day and 
and um, <laughs> and and where is the scene going? Mm-hmm. So sometimes I feel like they're—I I recognize that they're that they're they're an unequal partner in the scene. So they are they are they are they are they are they are, they are guiding it more than if they were just a, an actor in the scene. Right. Yeah. I mean, I it might be your projection a little bit because I never easily could be. I'm like I'm totally unaware of anything of anything like that when I'm acting in scenes. I'm just in, I feel like I'm just in there. Maybe there's something subconscious or subtle that I, I'm not seeing or understanding, but I'm definitely not thinking about making my day or anything. Like I totally lean, I lean on the production team and like all the people that are working on the movie to be like, okay, it's time to move on until I hear that. I'm not thinking about anything except just like, I really love, acting and especially love doing comedy and like doing this movie was so fun one when the camera was on that I wasn't definitely not thinking about anything else and I I don't micromanage performances either I only talk to the actors if they want to want to hear something from me you know like a lot of times actors won't I won't direct performances at all in scenes I, I really if actors are like was that okay what did you think of that? We'll start a conversation. But other than that, I pretty much leave them alone. You know? And it might be something I'm bringing because I feel, I feel that way about even watching Cassavetes. Mm-hmm. And when, when Cassavetes is directing himself, it's different than when he's directing uh, Ben Gazzara and, and Seymour Casal. Right. I, I'm, I'm, I, maybe it's just I'm aware, oh, here comes a director. Here comes a director. Yeah, it might be. But also... It could be something I'm totally bringing to. So, Sophia, how was it, how was it directing a movie that you weren't in? Um, it was really fun. Fun, and it was, was a lot easier than directing a movie that I was was in. I had more time to. It was really fun. I mean, it was a very particular shoot. I worked with actors that I didn't know before. We all lived in a house in Big Sur together, and uh, it was a very very intimate set, which was something that I had actively wanted to create going into the production. And I feel like by not acting in it, I was really able to. Um, focus on creating the environment and the energy that I thought was going to be most conducive to making the kind of movie I wanted. Whereas like if I had been in it, I think I would have been too distracted. It's like a very dramatic, dark movie. And the part that I had considered originally considered playing that I decided not to is like a very, very challenging role. And I think if I had stepped into it, not only would the movie maybe have been worse, but the like experience of making it for everyone would have been less pleasant. I think um, it felt cool to be in charge in a way that felt very collaborative, but like one of the struggles that I know that Larry kind of sometimes experienced on Wild Canaries was that because he was also an actor, a lot of times people would chime in in this way where it like felt, it felt like they were, it was just like this weird thing of like who's the director and like Larry was definitely the director but like people would chime in in a way that felt like kind of weird and like wait don't you realize that this is the director like (laughs) and that didn't happen with um in Big Sur really even though it was still collaborative you're wearing the hat exactly yeah what you're doing you've got one job and then and then uh, and so you're not switching off from like Hey, we're collaborating together to uh, hey wait a second I'm 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 talking to you right now yeah but that said like I would like to direct myself again and I would I like I prefer acting I think or it's at least more fun or maybe more glamorous seeming to me when I'm doing it um or like I feel like my ego wants me to be an actor and like my creative soul is like no you can be a director and make a movie every few years and that's enough um so it was kind of hard to give up doing that and feeling like, oh, this was such a good part that I gave up and I like should have, whatever, given myself this opportunity because no one else will, but. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I think that I might be that way even if I wasn't in the movie because I just tend to ask people what they think. Like I, I ask everybody on the crew, like, do you think that's a good idea for a shot? What do you think of that? And then people feel emboldened and then sometimes that can get out of hand and you have to like, shut it down <laughs> you know what i mean you have to be like okay guys i didn't ask for your opinion this yeah time. but you were like you were like asking director. for everyone's opinions with a fake black guy in a neck brace yeah like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it just felt funny to take you yeah. seriously yeah <laughs> well that's what i mean that is one of the things milo should say milo should, would say that that what he considered a good project is a project that is that can accept outside input 
that 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 you can sort of you can have that kind of you know that kind of like you know as long as as long as the director has a firm hand as long as the director knows what he wants a good idea can come from anywhere yeah i agree with that but it'd be stupid to 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 uh to you know cut out the dialogue and there were definitely directors who don't want anyone else's opinions mm-hmm. who don't want that you know that 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 kind of thing but i find it's more more interesting when when you know people are bringing what they the reason why you're hiring them is you're hiring you're hiring people you admire, hiring good people who whose work you, you, you care about and like let let them let them work let them work, let them breathe, let them offer something up. And if they feel they're they can offer something up, they're gonna bring you more, you know. Yeah, that yeah. Yeah. So so it's like a you know, it's a side effect that at times you may feel your set is slightly out of control and have to rein it back in. But that's something I can live with to get you know, to get everybody feeling like a vital part of the production. Well, it is interesting. I, I, I asked a question before I actually thought it all the way through, but, you know, your whole, the whole do-it-yourself movie-making um, uh, movement here is, you know, everyone seems to act in their own films and their, everybody else's films. So it's one of those things where, the, you know, that, that I'm not sure anybody, uh, these people, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, Swanberg think, thought of himself as an actor, He's certainly acting in a lot of his movies, and now his kids acting, and, now, and his wife is acting in his movies. And is it, is it, does that all a function of just being able to grab people around that you can trust, or you're having someone that said that you can also give a camera to if you need to? I mean, because you guys show up in other people's movies, and and then they show up in your movies, and all that kind of stuff. So that, that sort of that's not how it's ever felt to us. Like when we made Gabby on the Roof in July, we didn't know any of those people. We like cast them through an audition process. And with this, with Wild Canaries, we didn't. Re- we only knew a couple of the people who were in it. And with this new movie that I just made, Always Shine, it was all people that I had, you know, went through a regular casting process. And I think, I think like some people maybe, like we were saying, approached filmmaking from a writer director standpoint. They studied film in college, or they always grew up thinking they'd be a director and sort of fell into acting. I've, I've heard a lot of our friends be like, "I cast myself because I couldn't cast anyone else." Like, there was no one else to do it. But, I, I mean, like, Larry and I, well, I don't know. I mean, first of all, I always am like, you probably could have found someone else. You probably really do want to be an actor. You just feel vulnerable saying that. Because, like, there's a million hungry actors who would want to be in a movie for free. We found people to do that. I'm open. I wanted to do, be in Wild Canaries. And I it, it would have made my life a lot easier to cast somebody else in certain ways. I, You know, I wouldn't have had to sacrifice as much financially. The movie probably would have ended up being more commercial. So, I, like... You know, I paid for that decision. I really wanted to be in it. I'm open about that. Yeah, no, 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 I know. No, not, I'm not talking about that. particular that. film? No, no, I'm talking yeah. about other people. And, like, we, like, both studied acting for a very long time. Yeah, um, I've studied. I mean, I like, studied acting, you know. I, it's funny to me, like, when people, plenty of people fall into acting. Like, I just watched Hot, Hot Tub Time Machine 2 last night. The guy's name is Craig Robinson, right? Mm-hmm. That comedian? Yeah, he was a comedian. Like, comedians aren't actors. They're up on stage telling jokes. They're not actors. They're thrown in movies all the time, and then they're actors. Like, Joe, whether he wanted to be an actor or thought of himself as an actor, the guy's been in probably, like, 30 films. He's an actor now, you know? Or, like, when another yeah. funny thing that... Well, another funny slash funny thing is that... Um, when people are like, so, like, they ask Joe this, obviously, because he works with, like, really famous people. And, like, even with Wild Canary is a big, um, co- like, question is just, like, so you, like, decided to work with real actors or, like, calling certain people real actors. And we're just like, well, like, Kate Scheel is a real actor. She studied, she, like, went to Tish and she, like, now, like, now is doing so much work, but she wasn't not a real actor before. It's not like we just, like, found her in her house, like where she was not doing anything. So, in, and everyone that we've worked with, I would call a real actor. And I think that's just such a funny distinction just because people like aren't famous. The, the thing about Joe is, is, is now he's, he's working with people who are used to having a $200 million budget and a trailer and all that kind of stuff. And he's just kind of saying, come over and hang out. Right. It'll be fun. You can make it, you can make up your character. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, the, the question... Have you seen his latest film? Have you seen... Uh, Not no. the newest, no. Yeah, I don't it know. takes place at my house. Oh, yeah, we remember oh, right, they rented right. it out. So were you there for a lot of that? I was not there for any of the shooting. I would come and just check up, make sure things weren't broken. Did they break a lot of stuff? They did not break anything. Was... Oh, that's good. Did they have to... Did they, re... did they paint? 
Did they what? Did they like repaint or anything? Oh no, no. I mean, it's it's what what's what's funny is the um, it was different than having you giving your house to like a location for a commercial or something because um, uh, part of the plot of the movie is that they're house sitting for somebody. Oh. Didn't change a thing. So it's it's, it's I, I've only seen the movie once, but I, I almost can't even talk about it because it was an out of body experience because. It's just they're just living in my house and they're drinking out of my cups and they're they're using my towels, you know. <laughs> it's just sort of like, wait a second, this is real. This is really weird. Yeah. We, now, we, now your film takes place in your house, right? Yeah. Is that your building? That's our. Yep. Our, that's the building we live in. Yeah. The roof, the hallways. Even the person below us—that's an old lady's apartment. It, she. That's exactly the way it looks. Yeah, the old lady's apartment is a real old lady's apartment who really lives below us. And thinking about her gave me the idea for the movie. And she keeps asking to see it because, you know, we gave her money, like, to leave the apartment so we could shoot in there for a week. <laughs> and she's like, when am I going to get to see that movie? And I'm like, oh, it's about an old lady who dies. I don't really want to show it to you. <laughs> <laughs> and it was totally inspired by you. Here's a question. Uh, like, when you're watching the movie, an, an obvious influence seems to be um, Manhattan Murder Mystery. Yeah. Hell yeah. No, we've never seen that movie before. What? I said we'd never seen that movie before. Yeah. Should we run with that? <laughs> no, yeah. That was a big influence. We watched it many times while we were, while we were working on the uh, Or no, structure. we've never seen it before. It was just this crazy coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. We watched it and we're like, oh, man, it would be really fun to do something like this. What would it look like? And we just, that's, that's, that's kind of how we came up with, with the movie. Um, yeah. You know, but a lot of people rip Woody Allen off. So the question is... Mm-hmm. How well did we do it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. As long as you, as long as you steal from the best, that's what, that's really important. Yeah, I stole a lot. From, I also was really, really influenced by Truffaut and Blake Edwards. Like the definitely Truffaut. I can definitely feel that. When talk, talk about Blake Edwards. Just just the physical gags. I really like that stuff. I really like the Pink Panther, and I really like his comedies. I think he's great. Did you ever see that movie Sob? Yes. Oh man, I really like that movie. Interesting movie because it was like nominated for Oscars, but also Razzies. It was like, yeah. Wait, is that the one where Julie Andrews like basically plays Julie Andrews? Yeah, she plays. Cool. Yeah, I I really love his like Notting Hill. his sight gags and just kind of like his um <laughs> his color palette, like all the pinks and um just like playful colors and stuff. I don't know. It was more of just. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of a movie called The Party. Oh, that's one of the best movies ever. Kind of perfection. Yeah, that's like a perfect comedy. Yeah. So I would love to be able to to do a movie like that with a, even way more sight gags and things like. I would love to do a movie like The Party if I if I ever. What's funny about that movie? It is it is sort of a you know I mean it was him grabbing his pal and making a movie that takes place in the house. Yeah. And there are certainly certainly also those those there are sort of serious movies, but there was a certain point in Blake's career towards the end where he just sort of. You know, I wouldn't call them mumblecore movies, but certainly something like That's Life, which is basically his wife and his kids, and, and Jack Lemmon is playing Blake, Blake Edwards, really, and it's, it's being shot in his house, mm-hmm. doing it for very little money, and it's sort of just, uh, you know, an, an, an older version of, you know, instead, but instead of Brooklyn, it takes place in Brentwood. Yeah, totally. Like 10, I feel 10 is very much like that. Sure. Where Dudley, uh, Dudley Moore is just a doppelganger for him, and that has the great bit of, of his... Um, when he goes to the dentist and it goes on forever. Do you remember this? It's been a long time since I've seen it. Oh, man. That's a great bit. He can't speak for like but maybe then 25 t- minutes and in then the he, middle of the movie because his, his, his mouth has been numbed by the and dentist. And he's drunk. Anyway, so yeah, the, you know, <laughs> I was definitely, and Hitchcock too, I was trying to like reference all these things that I love just, um, you know. Well, you're naming guys who, like those two guys believe in the set piece. Mm-hmm. Sort of like, all right, we're you know, someone's going to come in and it's just going to you know, something's going to start to happen, and um, you know, and we're just it's going the scene is going to be about that, you know, it's going to be about her taking showers, it's going to be about her, you know, sitting outside and the birds coming or whatever. I mean, Scott and I are big believers in set pieces, and it's one of the things when we wrote um, fourteen oh eight when we done a bunch of comedies over our career, we'd never done a horror film, and it was like, oh, let's let's do just write a horror film, and we realized that. Sort of the the skills we used for writing like, comedic set pieces came in really handy when we were writing 
horror set pieces because they all they had the same kind of like build, you know, build to surprise, build to you know something's coming or build to you know something is happening and you're, and you're just, you know it's, it's so that's as interesting. You were comparing Edwards and and um, Hitchcock because they you know they are just two guys who are masters of the set piece. Yeah, I wanted to see if I could do some set pieces on a low budget. Uh, just to see if I could pull it off. Like one of the most fun days for me was um, if you uh, you watched the movie recently, so you probably remember there's like a suspense comedy scene in the in Jason Ritter's character's basement. Mm-hmm. That for me was my attempt to do a set piece with not a lot of money. You know, it was like 58 setups in in a day, so it was this crazy day that we had to do, and it was really 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 fun. We just loaded up on shots so many shots and certainly stuff like your the blocking of them following uh you know on the street with sophia poking her head up behind trees and things like that that has a that has a bit of a pink panther quality to the whole thing yeah i was i was trying yeah i was trying to do some set pieces with you know the limited time that i had you know make them work so that was really fun This is Nick Dawson from Talk House Film, and you've been listening to Larry Karashevsky in conversation with Lawrence Michael Levine and Sophia Takal on the Talk House Film podcast. The episode was engineered and edited by Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to Talk House Film and Talk House Music Podcasts on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can. You want to do them separately, or do we? No, together. Like do the thing where. Ready, one, two, three. This Hi, is this Larry is Lawrence Michael Sophia. Levine. Welcome to the Talk House podcast, podcast, where we talk to Larry. Larry. Karajewski. No, just the Talk House podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Lawrence Michael Levine. This is Sophia. Are you saying your full name? Well, no one's gonna know who I am. No people out there in the. Hey, this is the Talk House podcast. All right, this is Larry Levine. <laughs> Otherwise known as Lawrence Michael <laughs> Bean. Oh, wait, I gotta say for Talk House. This is Larry Levine, otherwise known as Lawrence Michael Levine, for the Talk House. Is that good enough?